The intelligentsia's feats of verbal virtuosity reach their heights, or depths, when discussing the crime rate among blacks in America. For example, New York Times columnist Tom Wicker responded to an incident in which a white woman jogging in Central Park was gang-raped by black youths by denying that this was a racially motivated crime. Wicker said, The fact that the victim was white and the attackers black does not seem to have caused the crime. He added, But if race does not explain this crime, race was relevant to it. The attackers lived surrounded and surely influenced by the social pathologies of the inner city. They hardly could have reached teenage without realizing and resenting the wide economic and social gap that still separates blacks and whites in this country, and they could not fail to see, and probably return, the hostility that glares at them undisguised across that gap. These influences are bound to have had some consequences, perhaps long repressed, probably not realized or understood, in their attitudes and behavior. The wide economic and social gap between blacks and whites that Wicker referred to was even wider in earlier years, when it was common for whites to go up to Harlem at night for public entertainment or private parties, and common for both blacks and whites to sleep out in the city's parks on hot summer nights during an era when most people could not afford air conditioning. But sleeping in parks, or in some cases even walking through some of those same parks in broad daylight, became dangerous in later and more prosperous times. Yet here, as elsewhere, the prevailing vision often seems impervious to even the plainest facts. The role played by many people who, like Tom Wicker himself, have incessantly emphasized gaps and disparities as injustices to be resented, rather than lags to be overcome, is seldom considered to be among the candidates for inclusion among the root causes of crime, even though the rise of crime is far more consistent with the increasing prevalence of such grievance and resentment ideologies than with other things that are considered to be root causes, such as poverty levels, which have been declining as crime rates rose. Resentments, based on ideologies of cosmic justice, are not confined to the intelligentsia, but trickle down to others. For example, right after charges of gang rape of a black woman were filed against white students on Duke University's lacrosse team in 2006, angry reactions from a black college in the same town reflected that same vision, as reported in Newsweek. Across town at NCCU, the mostly black college where the alleged victim is enrolled, students seemed bitterly resigned to the players beating the rap. This is a race issue, said Candace Shaw, 20. People at Duke have a lot of money on their side, Chan Hall, 22, said. It's the same old story, Duke up, Central down. Hall said he wanted to see the Duke students prosecuted, whether it happened or not. It would be justice for things that happened in the past. Implicit in these statements are the key elements of the cosmic justice vision of the intelligentsia, seeing other people's good fortune as a grievance, rather than an incentive for self-improvement, and seeing flesh-and-blood contemporaries as simply part of an intertemporal abstraction, so that a current injustice against them would merely offset other injustices of the past. There could hardly be a more deadly inspiration for a never-ending cycle of revenge and counter-revenge, the Hatfields and the McCoys writ large, with a whole society caught in the crossfire. The built-in excuse has become as standard in discussions of black crime as it is unsubstantiated, except by peer consensus among the intelligentsia. The phrase troubled youth is a common example of the unsubstantiated but built-in excuse since those who use that phrase usually feel no need to offer any specific evidence about the specific individuals they are talking about, who may be creating big trouble for others while enjoying themselves in doing so. An all-too-common pattern across the country was that in an episode in Milwaukee. Shayna Perry remembers the punch to her face, blood streaming from a cut over her eye her backpack with her asthma inhaler, debit card, and cell phone stolen, and then the laughter. They just said, Oh, white girl bleeds a lot, said Perry, 22, 
who was attacked at Kilburn Reservoir Park over the Fourth of July weekend. Milwaukee Police Chief Edward Flynn noted Tuesday that crime is colorblind. I saw some of my friends on the ground getting beat pretty severely. Perry needed three stitches to close a cut above her eye. She said she saw a friend getting kicked, and when she walked up to ask what was happening, a man punched her in the face. I heard laughing as they were beating everybody up. They were eating chips like it was a picnic, said Perry, a restaurant cashier. Most of the eleven people who told the Journal Sentinel they were attacked or witnessed the attacks on their friends said that police did not take their complaints seriously. About twenty of us stayed to give statements and make sure everyone was accounted for. The police wouldn't listen to us. They wouldn't take our names or statements. They told us to leave. It was completely infuriating. Variations on such episodes of unprovoked violence by young black gangs against white people on beaches, in shopping malls, or in other public places have occurred in Philadelphia, New York, Denver, Chicago, Cleveland, Washington, Los Angeles, and other places across the country, often with the attackers voicing anti-white invective and mocking those they left injured or bleeding. But such episodes are often either ignored or downplayed in most of the media and by officials, and the Chicago Tribune even offered an excuse for not reporting the race of the attackers in a series of such episodes that alarmed the Chicago public. Yet race is widely reported when it comes to imprisonment rates or other racial disparities. For example, in March of 2010, Secretary of Education Arne Duncan delivered a speech that highlighted racial disparities in school suspension and expulsion and that called for more rigorous civil rights enforcement in education. He suggested that students with disabilities and black students, especially males, were suspended far more often than their white counterparts. These students, he also noted, were often punished more severely for similar misdeeds. Just months later, in September of 2010, a report analyzing 2006 data collected by the U.S. Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights found that more than 28% of black male middle school students had been suspended at least once. This is nearly three times the 10% rate for white males. Further, 18% of black females in middle school were suspended, more than four times as often as white females, 4%. Later that same month, U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder and Secretary Duncan each addressed a conference of civil rights lawyers in Washington, D.C., and affirmed their department's commitment to ending such disparities. The very possibility that there might be behavioral differences behind the punishment differences does not surface in such discussions. To believe that there are no behavioral differences between black and white school-age males is to assume that the large and undeniable differences in crime rates, including murder rates, between black and white young adults suddenly and inexplicably materialize after they finish school. Professor David D. Cole of the Georgetown University Law School expressed views similar to those of Tom Wicker and many others among the intelligentsia of the multicultural era when he lamented the increasing imprisonment of black men. In the 1950s, when segregation was still legal, African Americans comprised 30% of the prison population. Sixty years later, African Americans and Latinos make up 70% of the incarcerated population, and that population has skyrocketed. The disparities are greatest where race and class intersect. Nearly 60% of all young black men born between 1965 and 1969 who dropped out of high school went to prison at least once on a felony conviction before they turned 35. Professor Cole posed the issue explicitly in the cosmic justice terms of John Rawls. Were we in John Rawls' original position, with no idea whether we would be born a black male in an impoverished urban home, would we accept a system in which one out of every three black males born today can expect to spend time in jail during his life? The preemptive assertion in passing that it is the system 
something external, created by others in the larger society, that is the cause of the problem, arbitrarily puts off limits at the outset the very possibility that the problem may be elsewhere. By sheer verbal virtuosity, rather than by any facts or evidence, collective responsibility is put on those in the larger society. There is clearly something in the circumstances into which many black males are born that makes it far more likely that they will commit crimes than is true of the population in general, including the majority of the black population that does not end up behind bars. But that tells us absolutely nothing about what that something is. If it is being impoverished, then clearly there is a lot less poverty today than in 1950, when the imprisonment rate among black males was lower, even though invoking poverty remains at least as much a part of the rituals, as distinguished from arguments, of intellectuals today as then. Professor Cole adds some other statistics, that only 5% of college-educated African Americans have spent time in prison, while the imprisonment rate for black male high school dropouts is nearly 50 times the national average. He also notes, Children with parents in prison are in turn seven times more likely to be imprisoned at some point in their lives than other children. None of this supports the claim that the cause is an external system, as asserted by Professor Cole, rather than an internal counterproductive culture, perhaps aided and abetted by outsiders who excuse or even celebrate that counterproductive underclass culture an underclass culture which has produced very similar results among lower-class whites in Britain, where similar ideologies of envy and resentment have long been promoted by the British intelligentsia. Both in Britain and in the United States, as well as in other countries, there has been a steady ideological drumbeat of rhetoric from intellectuals depicting gaps and disparities as grievances against those who are better off. In both Britain and America, this resentment and hostility generated by the intelligentsia has been directed by those who accept it, not only against members of the larger society, but also against those members of their own group who are working to do well in school in order to have a better life later on. What is truly remarkable in its implications is the contrast between the higher rate of imprisonment among young men in the black ghettos of America today compared to the 1950s, and how that undermines the very argument in which these imprisonment rates are cited. Surely, the supposed root causes of crime, poverty, discrimination, and the like, were not less in the 1950s, before the civil rights laws and policies of the 1960s. And what of those blacks who do not drop out of high school, but who go on to college instead, and seldom end up in prison? It should also be noted that, from 1994 on into the 21st century, the poverty rate among black husband-wife families was below 10%. Are these blacks living in a different external system, or do they have a different internal culture, representing different values in their families, or among others, who have influenced them? Yet such questions are seldom asked, much less answered. Instead, today's higher rate of incarceration is blamed on drug laws, tighter sentencing rules, and a general failure of society. In short, society is to blame, except apparently for those members of society who actually commit the crimes. But whatever the reasons for the higher crime rate now than then, or between blacks and whites, it is indeed a tragic injustice from a cosmic perspective, to be born into circumstances that make it more likely that one will commit crimes and be imprisoned, with negative consequences for the rest of one's life. If some personified fate had decreed this, then that would be the perpetrator of the injustice. But if this is just part of the way the world has evolved, then it is a cosmic injustice, if something as impersonal as the cosmos can be considered capable of being unjust. As noted in Chapter 4, a cosmic injustice is not a social injustice, and proceeding as if society has both the omniscience and the omnipotence to solve the problem risks antisocial justice, in which others are jeopardized or sacrificed in hopes of putting some particular segment of the population where they would be but for being born into adverse circumstances that they did not choose. 
It is certainly no benefit to blacks in general to take a sympathetic view of those blacks who commit crimes, since most of the crimes committed by blacks, especially murder, are committed against other blacks. Whatever the injustices of society that might be blamed as root causes of crime, the black victims of crime are not responsible for those injustices. Here especially, social justice in theory becomes anti-social justice in practice, sacrificing innocent people's well-being, or even their lives, because some other individuals are considered not to have been born into circumstances that would have given them as good a chance as others have had to achieve their own well-being without becoming criminals. Moreover, it is wholly arbitrary to imagine oneself in Rawls' original position as a potential black criminal, rather than as one of the far more numerous blacks who are victims of criminals. Those who say that we should do something seldom face the fact that everything depends on just what specifically that something is. Being lenient with criminals has not worked. Relieving poverty has not reduced crime. And certainly being non-judgmental has not done so either. Crime rates skyrocketed when all these things were tried, whether among blacks or whites, and whether in America or in England. The automatic celebration of cultural differences, or the non-judgmental view of socially counterproductive behavior, for example, cannot be continued if the goal is to improve the well-being of actual flesh-and-blood people rather than seeking cosmic justice for an intertemporal abstraction. One can be humane or inhumane only to living people, not to abstractions. I really love this quote. We seem to be moving steadily in the direction of a society where no one is responsible for what he himself did, but we are all responsible for what somebody else did, either in the present or in the past. One of the most important things I ever learned is that never let the person who put you down to be the one to raise you up. So even if for the sake of argument, we actually say that there is a certain group of people who are responsible for black poverty and black limitation, then it doesn't change what the solution is. Pick yourself up. If you say someone can give you freedom, then you automatically also say they can take that freedom away from you. As a matter of fact, freedom is not given. You buy freedom for yourself and the price is responsibility. So until people wake up and start taking responsibility for their own stuff, then the cycle continues. But at last, we can actually believe that most black people don't actually want freedom. We just want liberty. We confuse liberty with freedom. The opportunity to do anything and everything without consequence. And that's why we're going to vote people into office who are actually going to make things like shoplifting legal. But not knowing that as we shoplift from stores, they close and then we end up broke and poor and helpless in our neighborhoods. However, the funny thing is ignoring consequences doesn't make them go away. But let me know what you think about this in the comments below. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe, hit the bell. If you are new to the channel, thank you so much for watching. And until the next video, stay